Thank you very much. Thank you for the invitation to be here. I'm actually extremely happy to be at my second Velo City conference. As a Copenhagener, born and raised there, I'm, you can say, by birth, a bicycle nerd. And I can't imagine a forum that can be more bicycle nerdy than this forum these days. So obviously, this is kind of like paradise for a mayor like me who prioritizes bicycling, prioritizes green transport as much as I do. Copenhagen has been investing heavily in bicycles for a number of years. And we are increasingly prioritizing bicycles in our urban spaces. But for us, prioritizing bicycles, it's not an end in itself. As we've already heard several times here at Velocity, it's though an important and cost-efficient means a means to reaching our goals and developing the city in countless ways. New studies, new numbers that we just got this week show us that the modal share in Copenhagen today has uh, not unfortunately reached the targets we wanted to. We had the targets that the modal share for all commuting to work and public uh, work and study spaces should be 50% in 2015. I have to admit we won't reach that target. But the numbers also showed that in 2013, we are now up to 41% of all commuters riding their bike every day to work or to their place of study. If you take the citizens of the municipality of Copenhagen itself, the numbers have reached 60%. The cars are now down to 12. The last is okay. I still need some percentages before I can reach my aim of 50% of all commuting in Copenhagen, but I think 41 is okay. However, even if Copenhagen is regarded as some sort of cyclist's heaven by some, and I have heard that expression, and thank you very much, we don't consider ourselves that. We do have some challenges in our city before we, uh, we can move on, and some of the challenges I think we can all learn from. First of all, when politicians and urban planners seek to develop their cities all over the world, one of, one of the primary concerns we have is to enable citizens and traffic to move freely and to reach their destination easily. In constantly growing cities with an increasing demand for transportation, we all have to think of ways to make space for more uh, mobility. However, questions about traffic flow, about congestion and about capacity are almost uniquely discussed in reference to motorized transport, private vehicles, freight, and to a lesser extent, public transport. Very often, cycling and walking are still very far from being seen as serious means of transport, and very far from being seen as serious instruments to solve congestion challenges and help citizens reach their destination easily. This is also the case in Copenhagen. And it's, of course, regrettable, as cycling is both an extremely cost-efficient and space-efficient means to, to the uh, and solution to the increasing demand for mobility in our cities. We have pilot studies in Copenhagen that show that if just 10 to 20% of the cyclists on the busiest roads in Copenhagen one morning said, hey, I'm going by car today, and, and it, all the traffic would break down and the hill would break loose. And it's of course self-evident, because a person, one person in a car takes up so much more space than a person on a bicycle. For this reason, it is of great value that 41% of our commuters choose to go by bicycle every day. But furthermore, also about the cost. Con consider constructing one kilometer of new bicycle track is often up to 100 times cheaper than building one kilometer of metro line. So when I hear arguments like, and they come also in the city council of Copenhagen, how can we afford to, to build more bicycling? Or when people ask me, uh, say to me, we don't have the road space or the budget to prioritize cycling. I have to give the answer as, how can you afford not to? How can you actually find the space for anything else than bicycling? One of our streets, our main arteries, Nørre was rebuilt a couple of years ago to make substantial more space for bicycles and pedestrians. And at the same time, we wanted to reduce car traffic. The number of cars has been reduced by 60%. And at the same time, the number of bicycles through the street has increased by 20%. Today, more than 42,000 cyclists ride along the street every day. 
Actually, car traffic has gone down by 10% in the whole district surrounding the street. So it shows us that it, it works. At the same time, what's interesting is that the street has been transformed into one of the city's most popular hangouts with citizens of all ages sitting outside, enjoying the lively atmosphere and street vibe. Probably not at this time of year, but at most other times of year, you'll find that the Brugge is actually the hangout. And the funny thing was, when we made the transformation of the street, not one single city planner in Copenhagen told us this could be the, this could be the result. Everybody was just focusing on getting more people onto their bikes, as you can see here, that is from Nørrebroke itself. But the result, that it became one of the biggest hangouts in Copenhagen, was just a side effect, albeit one of the nicer ones. So Nørrebroke is an example of how an, an improved infra bicycle infrastructure can contribute to making Copenhagen a more attractive city, not only for those on bikes, but for everybody. So, but even though we are one of the best cities for cyclists, and I think I can claim that title, there's definitely room for improvement. One of our challenges is, provoking as it may be for some, is cycle congestion. Those of you who have, who have experienced Copenhagen by bicycle know that it takes some stamina to navigate a Copenhagen cycle track in the rush hour. Copenhageners on bicycles are fast, they are many, they don't relent, so you better get off, off their way if, if you're in their way, because they won't give you any space if they don't have to. On some of the roads, as I said, more than 40,000 on a weekday, right every day. The fact that cycle traffic is so concentrated limits the number of children, elderly people, and newcomers who feel safe and, uncomf on, and comfortable on a bicycle. This is obstacles to, to actually increasing the modal share. So one of the negative results is a generation of backseat kids. They may look happy on the back of their mom's and dad's bicycles, or from the front load of one of the many fancy cargo bikes, but they are still being reduced to passive passengers for the sake of safety. So Copenhagen's rush hour cycle traffic is simply too intense for many kids. But to me it's also important that we don't treat uh, cycling as like a religion, or cyclists as a separate group of citizens. In Copenhagen, we don't have cyclists. We have commuters on two wheels. Our approach has to be pragmatic, has to, be, has to consider the development as a city, of the city as a whole. Instead of a one-size-fits-all approach, we want to integrate the point of view of local citizens and use documentation and evidence of what works where every time we design concrete solutions. In Copenhagen, this means that we sometimes make these four meter wide one-way cycle track with room for both social cycling and, and fast-going races. In other areas, we make parallel green routes as completely separated from car traffic. And in yet other areas, we seek to slow down traffic, making shared spaces the solution. So here at Velocity Global, I hope to gather a lot of inspiration to expand our catalog of ideas and solutions to present back home. We don't claim to have found the holy grail in Copenhagen as for cycling. And I truly believe that actually we can learn a lot from, by, from each other by sharing experiences. I've already learned a lot from other cities with a less, le lot lesser modal share, I must say, things that I can bring back home to Copenhagen. This takes me back to the beginning of my speech and ending by saying that when we design our cities, we should be careful to consider if we can afford not to prioritize cycling both in terms of road space and budget-wise. But cycling is never a means, it should never be the end in itself. It should simply be regarded an extremely efficient, a very green, a very cheap way to create mobility, traffic flow, and quality of life and livability in our cities. And that, after all, is the aim for any uh, guy who's uh, actually concerned about urban development. Thank you. Thank you. It's uh, of course an honor to be here and uh, it's so inspirational for all of us to, to learn from each other and, and a big thank you to Copenhagen that is a, a role model for, for our work in, in, in Stockholm as uh, uh, more of, of, your, of cities uh, who are present here are. Well, I'm going to take you on a very compact journey on what we are doing in Stockholm right now to improve city life and of course what we are doing with, uh, with cycling. 
Uh, I was first asked to, to show you where, where we are. I, 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 I think that you know where Stockholm and Sweden are, uh, but uh, I show this uh, to, to show you how, how long we have traveled to, to come here and, and how dedicated we are to, to be here. <laughs> Well, this is Stockholm, and uh, we have, uh, it's, as you see, it's a very green and blue city, and we have, uh, uh, we have also a very fast-growing city, one of Europe, Europe's fastest, actually. Uh, right now, we are 900,000 inhabitants. We will be one million in six years, and uh, we uh, have a, a lot of goals uh, regarding growing as a city, and that, of course, is also something that, that puts a lot of challenges to us. Um, I would say that we have... Uh, as, as many other cities, we have, we have an history of uh, a, a city that is planned for the car since the 1950s or so. Uh, and that is, of course, something that increases our challenges. And, um, but at the same time, at the 1950s, uh, some of the politicians also made some wise decisions. So for example, to, to build a, a, a big subway system and to build a district, heat, a district heating grid system. Uh, and therefore, we are able to, to decrease uh, CO2 emissions at the same time as we have economic growth. Uh, since 1993 are these are graphs. But returning to the challenges of, of Stockholm, we are uh, has said to be a, a completely fossil fuel free city uh, by the year 2050. We are going to build 140,000 new homes in the city uh, in the next 15 years. We have, uh, as I said, we are a fast-growing city. We have to decrease traffic congestion. We have a congestion charge system in Stockholm. Uh, even though we haven't uh, increased the charges, we, are, we have still a 20% decrease in traffic, uh, uh, still because of that system. Uh, we have uh, the dedication to, to actually convert uh, the car city to a more walkable city. And that is, of course, something that is not so easily done. We are going to build 10 new subway stations in Stockholm. We are going to double the model share for, for bikes. And these are the, the tools we have to our help. Uh, we have a city master plan. It's called the Walkable City. So we are trying to really build a city in a way, planning the city in a way that you don't have to use the car. Uh, you should be able to go uh, walk, to, to go by bike or public transport, to, to work and school, and etc. We have a uh, strong environmental program that says that we are supposed to, to preserve green areas at the same time that we are building a dense city. Uh, also, the environmental program says that we should promote biking. We have an accessibility strategy, which says that we should, in order to, to, to be a more accessible city, we should prioritize bikes and buses, public transport, but also actually uh, uh, delivery trucks and so, and so on. We, we think that if we, we, we want to, to make people not own a car, we should be able to, to shop in the city and to also have more home delivery and so on. And we have a bike plan. Uh, which uh, points out where we are supposed to, to build the, the commuter uh, bike lanes network that we have and, and are trying to, to increase in Stockholm. So uh, what we have then is to, to become a more bike-friendly city from the car-friendly city we are today. And uh, what we have done is that we are uh, investing one billion sw Swedish uh, kronor, that is uh, approximate, approximately 110 euros, until the year 2018, just to build infrastructure for, for bikes. Uh, we call it the bike billion. Um, when we have dedicated the money for it, we, we immediately saw new problems. Uh, money is not the only problem. The problem is to have capacity to, to build uh, and, and to also maintain the, the grid that we have today, the infrastructure that we have today. So the next step was to, to implement the bike lane maintenance squad. Uh, which uh, are riding around in, in, in Stockholm and, and fixing uh, uh, holes in the, in the bike lanes and so on. Uh, also uh, sweeping and, uh, and cleaning out snow. You know, we have a lot of snow on the bike lanes, uh, some months of each year. And uh, when we had done that, we saw that, okay, uh, everything isn't done properly. We have still uh, 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 some, well, it's, it's difficult to, to actually get the whole administration to work uh, towards this goal, and, and sometimes we don't even have the competence. So uh, we had to, to uh, implement a new bike strategy. 
which one of the most important points in this is, is to, to educate all the planners, all the entrepreneurs, all the people doing the work in the streets and so on, on how you, you think as a bicyclist. Because in a city that has been planned for the car for, for 70 years, that is not easily done. So we are putting all, all the people in, 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 uh, in education to, to, to learn how, how bicyclists uh, uh, work, how we work. So uh, what we have done, uh, what we have up upcoming right now is uh, uh, we are uh, actually, and this is maybe a, a somewhat symbolic uh, thing, but not only, of course, it also is a, a, a thing about accessibility and also about efficiency. We are converting car lanes to bike lanes in, on, on uh, several streets in Stockholm, and it's quite bold since it's an election year this year. Um, one of the largest uh, streets in, in Stockholm will uh, we will take two car lanes and convert them to bike lanes uh, in a couple of weeks. Uh, the, the work is actually done right now. And in one of the most conservative parts of Stockholm, they actually are taking away the, the car parking places uh, to, to build uh, public transport, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, more, more space for public transport and for, for bikes. So that this would be really exciting uh, in the upcoming election. Um, we also are going to raise the congestion charges, which is uh, something that uh, we should have done maybe earlier. But we will, uh, we will use the income to, to build the 10, 10 subway stations that I talked about earlier. And that, of course, will also uh, decrease the, the, tra the car traffic in, within the city's borders. And we will have Stockholm Open Streets again, and maybe a symbolic issue, but uh, uh, one of the streets will be closed down during the weekends this summer. And uh, we will instead have uh, big markets, we will have food trucks, we will have uh, bi bicycle races and so on. So this will be really interesting also uh, to, to show what, what the space of the street can, can, can do for, for livability of, of, of the city. And we are applying, uh, we are running to, to have the Velo City Conference in, in 2017, which is, uh, uh, I mentioned this because it's, uh, it's important for us to, to work with stakeholders within the city, with the university and so on, and also within uh, the city hall. Uh, so therefore we have uh, not only me from the majority, we have also uh, a delegate from, from the opposition, from the Social Democratic Party here, here with us on this conference. We think it's important when we have actually almost a consensus uh, about the importance of, of building infrastructure for bikes and promoting bikes. We should also work together. So that is what we're trying to do. Thank you. So let me first thank you for inviting me here and giving me the opportunity to share some thoughts with you. Um, I'm going to be introducing briefly uh, the Viennese strategy uh, concerning public spaces and, of course, the role that cycling plays within the strategy. Now, when we talk about the quality of cities, we need to talk about public space, I believe. I mean, what is a city, actually? A city is much more than just the sum of buildings and infrastructure. I believe that, actually, the city materializes, the city can be experienced in public space. The city is what you actually encounter as soon as you leave back your office or your home and enter public space. So clearly, if we want to have a bike-friendly city, and if we want to have a city that provides a high quality of life, uh, then, of course, we need to focus on urban spaces and their qualities. That means we need a vision, we need a clear plan how to get there, and we need strong leadership because it won't work without controversy. Now, in the following minutes, I would like to present four ideas, or let's say four theses, uh, about what is a good city, actually. Uh, and when I'm talking about a good city, I mean a city that provides high quality of life for everybody, and not just for the few that can afford everything. And, um, Along these four theses, I will try to introduce briefly uh, the Viennese uh, public space strategy. So, my first thesis is, a good city is a place where people want to live, not a place where they have to live. Now, what do I mean by this? I mean, look at the pictures that I've brought. On the left hand is, for me, just a typical picture of a place where people have to live. 
But I couldn't imagine that any one of you would just say, oh, how wonderful, I'm buying a flat there. I want to live there. Now, when I'm talking about cities where people want to live, I'm talking about cities that are good to children. Why? Because what children need in order to grow up in a happy manner is pretty much what we all need in order to be happy. We all want for our children green spaces. We all want them to be able to move around freely and safely. We all want them to have access to nature. We all want them to be able to experience like some things like playing with water, just to give you a few simple examples. And this is most probably the reason why young couples, well, in Vienna they do so, as soon as they know that the first child is arriving, think they will, that they will have to leave the city and buy a little house somewhere in the countryside. So if we're talking about cities that offer quality of life, I think that we have to con construct our city in a way that we're able to defeat people's longing for the little house in the countryside by providing all qualities that they need and they think that they will find there within the city. And to be honest, I believe that if we do not succeed in defeating this longing for the little house in the countryside, then we're going to end up with huge, with tremendous problems, because I don't need to talk uh, here about urban sprawl and what all this means in terms of mobility, in terms of infrastructure costs, and in terms of quality of life for thousands of people that will have to commute for many kilometers per day in order to access their working spaces, schools, whatever it is they need and could never have in the suburbs. So that means we have to create a compact city that is dense but beautiful and offers all we need within walking distance or maybe cycling distance. We need attractive, dense city parts with mixed uses, no tie cities, no pyjama cities. Just see to it that you have all uses in every city part, as I said, mixed. We need shops and offices in ground floor level and we need green spaces and places to enjoy uh, outdoor life. And if we do this, that means that we result in cities full of life. Which brings me to the next thesis. A good city is a place where people meet and exchange thoughts, goods, and inspiration. Now, Jane Jacobs, who was very inspirational to me, once said, the outside of the houses is the inside of the city. We have to put major emphasis on urban spaces so that people actually can experience and enjoy their city. This is a huge challenge for city leaders because this means redoing public space. In Vienna, we try to work on three levels. First, we redefine old squares and improve their quality so that people can actually use them. Or let me put it in other terms, people will actually want to spend time there and won't just regard them as transitory places where they will just pass through as quickly as possible so that they can get to whatever target they have. I will just show you in the next picture. Yes, in the picture before. This is, for instance, a very central square that we have redone in, in Vienna something like almost 10 years ago and which now has very, very high quality uh, for people, young people love it, and, and on warm and sunny days, they will just tend to spend time outdoors there. Um, so it's just an example for what we're doing in, in redoing, as I said, public spaces. Second, we ensure the usability and accessibility of existing public and green space. We have had huge controversy in Vienna in the last years about opening up public gardens and giving people the opportunity to actually lie on the lawn. It wasn't possible a few years before. You just had to sit there and look at it, but you weren't actually allowed to experience it. So usability is, is very crucial. And the third strategy we have here um, in terms of urban planning, we reimagine our streets. Um, now, what I mean by this, right now the picture that you can see on the right part is um, a, a big uh, commercial road that is actually right now being turned into a pedestrian zone. We started redoing it last week. There has also been huge controversy on this, but the main idea is 
to see to it that we transform streets into pedestrian zones. And even if we still let them be car streets, we broaden the sidewalks, we put cycling lanes in there, we put lounge seats in there, we, we engage a strategy of micro piazzas wherever possible and see to it that you think of streets as part of your city, part of your public space, and not only places where cars should be able to move freely and quickly around. The third strategy and thesis for a good city um, has to do with mobility, clearly. If you want people to meet, get them out of their car and let them use their feet. Now, I mean that the key to a beautiful city full of life is to give people all reasons to leave their car at home and enjoy their journey and regard the journey as something that they want to do and enjoy and not something that they have to do in order to get to work or school. Um, so, you have to see to it that public space is attractive and of high quality. You have to see to it that traffic speed is comfortable at 30 kilometers per hour. Now, in Vienna, 75% of all roads are within 30 kilometer speed zones. All residential areas actually uh, have a, a 30 kilometer per hour speed limit. Um, you have to see to it that there are sharing schemes for cars and bikes. I think that it is very important to introduce bike sharing schemes. In Vienna, we have a bike sharing scheme for more than 10 years now, and we're heavily investing in car sharing schemes right now, telling people that if you want to drink a glass of milk, you don't have to buy a cow. So if you want to use a car every now and then, you don't have to buy one, okay? It's just vital, crucial that you can use one if you need it. And I think that also very important is that we combine different modes of transport, intermobility, modality is crucial, and here the bike uh, plays a very, very important role. Uh, it may, might be that this is uh, also the main argument why you need to introduce bike sharing schemes. It is the glue to different modes of transport and makes it possible to people to, uh, as I said, um, be able to use different modes wherever they need this during the day. Um, now, this means, brings me to my fourth thesis. A good city means dialogue and controversy. Now, clearly, committing to open government and involving citizens in decision-making is quite a hard task. Uh, and it is a hard task if a city perceives itself as an agent of change. Change always means controversy. Change means strong advocacy and strong visionary leadership. And above all, an open and thorough dis discussion um, on what are the aims, what are tools of participation, but also what are the limitations of participation. Um, I think we also need to take a closer look, and this is what we want to do in Vienna in the next year, on the relationship between representative democracy and direct democracy. And I think that, yes, if, as I said, if you want to, to introduce change in your city, then that means that you have to do a great deal of cons consultation, you have to let people participate, you have to try to convince people. But what I mean is that you also have to know what you want, and you have to be able to do it, and you have to be able to take decisions at a certain point. Now, um, it was, Henry Ford, who more than 100 years ago once said, if I had asked people what they want, they would have said faster horses. And what I mean by this is that if you always have to ask people before you start changing things, then you're not getting very far and not so quickly. And I really believe that what we have to do in our cities is to be quick in introducing change because cities are growing very fast uh, it's going to be more than 70% of the world's population living in big cities by the year 2050. And this means huge challenges in terms of public space, in terms of quality of life, in terms of mobility. So we have to go for it, and we have to go for it now, and we have to be fast, and we have to be decisive. So I will just conclude by presenting to you, um, well, this quote that I found in Copenhagen. Louisiana. There was a great exhibition there a few years ago. And as soon as I found this quote, I knew 
uh, what my mission is. It says that those who agree with you are insane, those who disagree with you are in power. Some of those in power, though, are insane, and they are right. And I think that my, this might be the quote with which I would like to welcome the Lord Mayor of Adelaide. <laughs> Thank you very much, Adam. And I've got to say, I do sometimes wonder if I am truly insane with the uh, sort of feedback. And uh, I've got the, uh, the president of the Australian Local Government Association in the front telling me I am. OK, uh, first and foremost, I'm not going to talk about Adelaide uh, for the next five minutes. I'll give you a tip. It's out there to the left, to the right. Grab a bike and go your hardest. In fact, I'd love you to go for a bike ride around the city of Adelaide, and when you're exhausted, stop at a cafe, buy a coffee, buy some food, and tell the business owner that the Lord Mayor sent you and told me I should spend my money in your shop. There is an election coming up. <laughs> but I am uh, going to just touch on the experiences I've had as Lord Mayor in terms of leadership. Uh, I am an urban planner. I'm a, a keen urban futurist. Uh, and I did jump the fence because I got sick and tired of giving good advice to people I didn't necessarily think really had their head around the issues. Uh, and so I feel like, in some ways, a bit of a spy, trying to reprogram myself as an elected member so that I can help the professions actually understand what it's like to be a decision maker, to be a mayor, uh, to have that political paradigm within the decision making process. Many of these things are easy, but I really hope that I could just inspire you with one or two of them when it comes to making a difference and making you stop and think uh, before you necessarily go out there and try and tackle the issue you really are keen on making a change for. Number one, motivated people achieve great results. It is really important uh, when you're a leader to listen and support. And when I was an urban planner, all I wanted is my elected members to listen to me understand what I was saying, respect my opinion, and back me to the hilt. And right now in the City of Adelaide, we've had four annual staff surveys, and the morale has gone up every single year. That has seen an absolute change, not only in the organisation, but how the organisation deals directly with the community. If your staff are motivated, if they're empowered, if they've got the ability to make decisions and they can know that they're allowed to help find results, you start to see a change in your community. And I'm starting to see business people and residents uh, and other stakeholders in the city telling me that they're getting better results from the administration than ever. Number two, connect to your community. Now, it sounds obvious, and we all talk about social media, but it is the future. You need to get out there. You need to be able to make your message go viral. And as the generations change and the next group of leaders come up, they will be digital natives, and you need to be a part of it. If you're in your 60s or 70s, that's OK. You've only got 30 or 40 years ahead of you to get your head around where this is all going and what role you can actually play. Work with the good media people, because if you don't work with them, the bad people in the media are going to take over and control the message. Uh, but also, get those third-party advocates. Get your Chamber of Commerce online. Get them supporting them. Get them to explain the benefits to business. Get the health people to explain the health benefits. You know, you don't need to be the single person standing in front of a community telling them what they need to do. But also, here's a question for you. Who here has knocked on every single business door in their main retail strip? We've got one, two, three, four. You know, you can spend an entire day sitting in an office working out how you're going to engage the community, what the message is going to be like, what colour the flyers should be, and which day of the week you're going to drop it in their letterbox. And the time you've done that, you can actually go out and speak to every single trader yourself. Uh, whether it's the Rundle Mall here, it takes me three days. Rundle Street, uh, just over half a day. Aguja Street, about the same. It actually doesn't take that, take that long. And once you've walked into the door, whether you're an elected member or a staff member, next time you go back, they say, g'day, Stephen, what would you like today? And you build a relationship these, with these people. It, don't be afraid to actually get out there, walk through the doors, and just say, 
I'm from your local city council, you know, I'm working on this project, we'd love to just to introduce yourself, have a chat, find out what's important to them and how you can relate to them in a way that is meaningful to them, not to you. And that leads to point number three, communication. Now, it's an obvious one as well, but I really have learned a powerful lesson. The difference between someone who is good at their job, and you are all good at your jobs, you're all passionate about cycling, you're here because you want to make a contribution, but the difference between being good and being great at your job is the ability to actually communicate those values to other people, the skills to actually be able to talk to other people. I know Adam's a, a mathematician and a science scientist, but he gets celebrated because he's a great communicator that can get out there and engage a whole new audience in science, in mathematics, in issues that are foreign to them, but communicated in a way that directly relates and helps them understand. So uh, some tips there, ask questions. Don't tell anyone what they need to do. Ask a small business owner if a car going slower past their shop is gonna make it easier for them to see their display. Ask a shop owner if it's gonna be easier for a cyclist to put their brakes on and actually jump in and buy something if they see something in the window. Don't tell them they need cycling. Ask them and let them work it out. Paint pictures that people understand. Not everyone is a cycling advocate. Not everyone is a town planner. These are people that spend their entire lives sitting behind a counter desperately hoping people are gonna walk into their business and help them put food on their table understand what their issues are and create the information and use data. I think Jeanette Setakhan talked about that last night, but if it's not measurable, it's not manageable. Great news, Frome Street Bicycle Way has seen a 41% increase in women riding down that street. You get five seconds to tell a journalist the information that they can use, you look straight in the camera and you give that information to them. Um, number, four, number four, change is hard. Every single one of you in this room gets out of bed in the morning because you want to change stuff. Most of the community don't like change. I've studied it, I've talked to psychologists. Two great examples. Change traditionally in a human body was about fight or flight. It was about survival and it was about survival of the fittest. Your breathing actually goes shorter, your muscles tense up and you want to defend or run. That's what happens when you see something foreign. That's the chemical reaction that the average person happens when they're challenged with change. Another great example. It actually works in the mind, the human mind. The longer something stays the same, the more it must be right. We have been driving cars for 50 to 60 years now, so it must be the right thing to do, and change is only here to make it more difficult for what we've been doing all of the time. We use the term NIMBY as planners, as change agents. I'm here to tell you that it's not their fault. The only reason they don't like the change is because we are not communicating the right way to get them to understand why what we want to help them with is in their best interest. So if you can't get your head around that, go back to step three and start dealing with communication again. If you've got there, number five, make some mistakes. Um, there is no such thing as mis uh, not making mistakes in an entrepreneurial ecosystem. You've got to motivate your staff to get out there, to be able to be delegated, to make decisions, and actually solve problems on the ground. If they make a mistake, pat them on the back and say, good try, get out there, keep chipping away, because I know you believe in what you want to do. You know, we have to make mistakes, because not all answers that are for Stockholm or Vienna are, are going to apply in Adelaide. Every single city is unique, and the decisions must be local, and we're going to screw up along the way, but we're going to have fun when we do it. Placemaking, really, really important. I love lighter, quicker, cheaper, and if I was going to give you a, a little tip, tip, if you want to put pl uh, bicycle lanes in, and I wish we'd done this for Frome Street, put in planter boxes with lots of flowers and lots of greenery, and then when they want to rip out the bicycle lane, you can say, you don't like flowers? You could put veggies in, food as well. Now, number six, look, dare to dream. I genuinely believe in the transformation of cities, and we are seeing cities transform every day, every week, every month. 
The example I like to cite, and I know, uh, acknowledge my friend uh, Kathy Oak from the city of Melbourne, 20 years ago, the downtown area of Melbourne was an absolute shithole. It was terrible. And it has transformed into arguably the greatest CBD environment on the face of the planet, ranked the world's most livable city right now for the next couple of years until we take over. <laughs> Cities are changing rapidly and we really need to understand and don't think about the probable. Don't think about the potential. Think about the absolute possible and engage people in a conversation around actually what can, be hap what can happen in the future. Number seven, be frank and fearless. I'm going to admit that one of the reasons I became the Lord Mayor is because I was almost unemployable. I was not very good at being dished up the rubbish that the, my managers told me I had to write, especially if I didn't believe it and especially if I thought it was wrong uh, or immoral and I was doing it just to please political forces. Stand up for what you believe in. You will be respected. Take people on. Tell them they're wrong. Tell them that you want their job. Tell them that you want to make a difference in your community. And ultimately, if you don't like where you are, if you're not getting the answers, it's easy. Quit. Go and find a better job. Find your dream job where people respect and understand you. Theoretically, if our mayors and our leaders are telling us to do the wrong thing, theoretically, you'd like to think as experts, they wouldn't be able to find anyone to work for them. And that's what we really need to do. We need to be strong, ethical, frank, and fearless. And the truth is, if you're not having fun in your job, you're not in the right job. Um, and finally, um, I was told by my good friend, the Lord Mayor of Melbourne, that mayors in their cities are like pets and their owners. Uh, the truth is that who you are as a person reflects your friends, your family and your community. For the mayor itself, the mayor is absolutely the mood of the community. If I'm worried, you're all going to be worried. If I'm sad, you're all going to be worried and wonder why I'm sad. If I'm confident and optimistic about Adelaide's future, you will believe in Adelaide's future. I ride, I walk, I swim. Uh, I use public transport and I drive an electric car. And when I get up in the morning, I look in the mirror and make sure that I am the person I want to be in life. You should too, and you should all make sure that when you get out of bed every day and you are believing in a future, you are the change you want to see in our cities. Thanks very much. Per, can I just clarify one figure you had in your presentation? One billion kroner? One billion kroner on projects in Stockholm, is that right? Because that's about $200 million Australian. What was that one billion for? For bike infrastructure uh, that will be invested in, until the year of 2018. And that's in a, is Stockholm's population about one million people, am I right? It's going to be in uh, 2020. So $200 per person? No, 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 no. Oh, well, yeah. You're the math math mathematician, so yeah, that's right. <laughs> How, where, uh, who, who did you have to convince? Where does the money come from? That, that strikes me as visionary and amazing. Was that hard to organise? Well, um, no, actually, not that hard. We, ha we have, a, a, as, I, as I mentioned, a rather, uh, now we have a, almost a consensus on, on the importance on on uh, promoting uh, uh, cycling in the city. And I think the, the key was that we had this work with the uh, accessibility strategy. Uh, and it showed that, I mean, Stockholm is an old city. We have uh, buildings from the 16th and 17th century. And, and uh, 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 we, we can't make the, 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 the streets broader. We have to use it more efficient. And that was the, the work that led, we had, we had that on the table. Uh, that was the work that led, led forward to, to the decision that we, we can't in, invest in more car infrastructure in, in the city. We, we can't squeeze in more cars. And, and we know that the people that move to cities like Stockholm, they are often are wealthy. They, they can afford one or even two cars. And uh, that, that is not sustainable. We, we can't have uh, uh, 100 uh, new inhabitants and 100,000 new cars at the same time then we all would be st stuck in, in, uh, in traffic congestion, no matter if we had congestion shortages or, or not. So we had to do th something, something different. Let me ask all of you then, when it comes to this, we understand the long-term savings, we understand the dollar-term savings in the long-term. 
who provides the money up front? With the visionary things that you've seen happening, has it all come from local council? Has it been a local and state, a local and federal? Where should the money come from? To all of the panel. Okay. Well, I can start then. Uh, of course, let's say the, the, the biggest amount of the money comes from local government in Austria. Uh, because Austria is a federal state, so uh, this means that the city of Vienna, which is also a state at the same time, provides for almost, let's say, 80% of the budget. But then, uh, what we also do is that when we have new city parts uh, that are being constructed, we ask investors and we ask the construction companies to also think of cycling uh, from the beginning on and they will have to build cycling lanes and whatever is needed in terms of infrastructure within the new city part and finance it themselves. Well, the system in Copenhagen is uh, very much the same, I'd say. Not that Denmark is a federal state, but that it's a city pays most of it. Uh, most of the infrastructure within Copenhagen is paid by the city of Copenhagen, but then we have corporations with uh, municipalities around us and actually being sub a bit subsidized by government. So, uh, to found what we call su super bicycle uh, lanes or bicycle highways in order to get the commuters to, to actually change from cars uh, to, to bicycles. So, but most of it is paid out of uh, the tax that uh, the, the residents are paying. And still, well, it's the cheapest solution. If I ask them to, uh, to cough up with uh, money for, for highways or for more roads, then it would be a lot more expensive for them. So in that sense, Copenhageners are saving money when we inf invest in inf uh, bicycle infrastructure. Well, Adam, we've got a Prime Minister who rides a bike a lot and is spending zero dollars on bicycle infrastructure in this nation, which is very sad. Uh, in fact, also no money on public transport. Uh, this current federal government is all about roads. It's been made very clear, and it's something that uh, we in uh, local government, in fact, all the Lord Mayors of Australia are exceptionally disappointed about. Uh, a state government uh, does a good job. Uh, to a certain extent, although their budget is half a percent uh, of the roads budget, and we don't have an up-to-date uh, bicycle plan here in South Australia, and we do need that. So uh, whilst local government gets 4% of the nation's taxable income and has responsibility for 90% of the nation's infrastructure, we'll just roll up our sleeves and get on with actually transforming our cities our uh, communities, uh, our states and our nation, while um, the other lot just talk. One of, the, uh, one of the stalls outside does have a little postcard campaign. They're trying to, launching it today, trying to encourage all the Australian delegates to send a message to the Prime Minister asking for $7.5 billion in funding for bike lanes around all of Australia, which would make us the best country in the world at it. And the, uh, the postcard shows you how to balance that up against health savings, and the like. It's fair to say that's probably a fairly ambitious ask at the moment, but all we can do is have a crack. I liked what you said, and please just signal to the people there if you'd like to ask any questions. Oh, we do have a What would you like to ask, mate? Uh, <clears throat> hi, my name's Ben Zion. I'm a journalist from In Daily. Um, I'd like to ask all of the Lord Mayors, but particularly Stephen, um, given that you've been here for two days and you've um, been exposed to all of these uh, people from the international community, experts and the like, um, are you taking any ideas away in a policy sense that you feel like you might be implementing? Now, I'm going to stop you there for a second because you have stolen what was going to be my final question to the panel, so we will finish with your brilliance. So I will ask you in closing, what's one thing you've seen in the last couple of days that you've thought, wow, I love that. So let that roll around in the back of your head from different presentations that you've seen so far, because it's the per you should be an MC. It's the perfect way. We're going <laughs> to we're, we're swing down the panel and ask you in closing one thing you've seen that's absolutely inspired you. I've got limited sight here because if you find another home with those microphones, you guys wave to me, okay? Can I ask you, I saw, it was interesting, Maria, you were saying controversy and dialogue, it's just the way it goes. There has to be a little bit of controversy doing these things. Yesterday, Jeanette was saying she just, she consulted and consulted and consulted. You're saying, Stephen, you've got to connect with the community. Is there a bit of a, a disagreement there? Tell me about the role that you think controversy plays and why it's inevitable. No, I don't see that there is disagreement. Uh, to be honest, this is the way you have to do it. You have to consult people, you have to visit their shops, you have to even, uh, well, in Vienna we visited every flat 
Can you imagine this? this we, when we did this pedestrianization, we decided that we have to ask people if they want it, and it was 33,000 households that we visited within three weeks. So it is a hard job, and in the end, we, we came through this, the, um, well, the survey or whatever you would call it now in English. But anyway, what I mean is that you have to know what you want still. Because the problem is that you have to consult people, you have to see to it that you convince them, but at the same time, you have to take decisions. And I don't think that there's a, con a con controversy in this, but in a sense, it's a dilemma. And it is a dilemma that works for each and every one of us, because there are things that you know that you have to do them. If you don't do them, then people are going to be suffering and they're going to lose money, and they're going to lose time, which is also a very precious good. And actually deciding when do I ask people, and about what do I ask them, and what are the limitations to participation, is a very hot issue, I believe, that cities will have to address in the next years. Um, because, I mean, look at Europe, one last example. In Europe, you have Switzerland. Anybody here from Switzerland? Okay. So you know what I'm talking about. In Switzerland, when you want to pass an urban development plan, it takes about 10 years, I guess, and you have to ask people about three times if they want it. So it's all about time. I want to change things now. $33,000, in, in, even you would have trouble getting around that many that quickly. That's unbelievable. I saw you nodding there, Morton. You agree with what Maurice said? I do, um, because, well, of course, we have to make consultations, we have to hear and engage uh, local citizens. We, we also do that, but sometimes we, you can say, we, all, we just take the initiative. When we rebuilt the main artery of Nørrebroke, then we actually went out there, did it, and took a trial period, and then went out asking people, so how did you feel about this? showing the results, finding the results there, also finding out that 82% of the people living there actually was in support of it. More than 60% of the car owners supported it, actually. Mm -hmm. So, it, but it was also because they could see the result. And of course, a lot of uh, details had to be changed, had to be redone. Some of it had to be removed and so on. But, but the, the main idea could be carried through. People could actually see why we, why we had been doing it. Per, when people first promoted Stockholm fossil fuel free by 2050, now, if you, if you attempted to run that argument in Australia, there's a portion of the community who would just go and lock you in the Perspex think tank and go, you can't come out, you're mad. I personally think it'd be great, but that, I, politically that just would not fly in Australia at the moment. Was that a con controversial thing to get on the agenda in Stockholm or was it popularly received? Fossil fuel free by 2050. I would say it's the opposite. If we didn't do it, they would lock us up. So really? uh, yeah, actually we have, we have a large uh, support among the citizens of Stockholm to have a, to push a, a, a tough uh, agenda when it comes to environmental poli policy. So, uh, so uh, that is something that, that uh, all political parties in Stockholm has, has to deal with. And that, that's, that does my work <laughs> easy, of course. So, so, um, but but uh, regarding the cons consultation issue, I, I think in, in Sweden we have, we have uh, a lot of laws that says that when you're supposed to change a, a plan for the city and so on, you are obliged to have uh, uh, meetings and so on. And I think that uh, those laws has me meant that, that we, we, are, we are not seeking ways actively to to consult in other ways than those way that, that we must do uh, according to law. And I think that is a, a big challenge for, for, for us in Stockholm to, to find new ways to, to talk with, uh, I mean, the people that come to those, those meetings are 100% are those who, who are against the, the proposal. So, so I think the, the challenge is to, to, to have uh, those uh, um, uh, consultations with with average people to, to seek them up. And I think that social media is, is one thing that, that I often uh, use when it comes to, to bicycling uh, issues. Uh, I mean, if, if there is a, a hole in a, in a bicycle lane uh, 20 kilometers out of the city center, I know it within, a, within an hour. So, uh, and of course, that, that, that's, uh, that puts uh, new, new demands on politicians to, to be uh, transparent and to be there and to be present in, in all those arenas. And, uh, but I think it's, uh, actually, it's, it's, it's worth the time. Yeah, people Definitely. don't turn up to a meeting just to say they, yeah, sort of agree, whatever, do whatever you want, do they? I'll try, <laughs> I'll try and squeeze these two questions in, depends how long the answers are. We were there with you first, ma'am. What would you like to ask? 
Okay, um, I'm Sue from Malaysia, Penang. And um, so just to give, I've got to give context. I've been sitting in this conference for the last two days and feeling like quite removed from the conversations that have been in this conference. I feel like we're in a completely different level of development. Mm. Um, society is completely different. Um, also to give context, um, I, I became very famous in Penang uh, very early in my term uh, because I was in the newspapers every single day in every newspaper for three months. Um, um, because we did essentially one month into a term, uh, we were going to implement some traffic changes which I had no role in designing. Um, um, but I became very famous because I stuck to public consultation. Before we implemented, I told council, no, we have to explain it to them. Middle of the trial, I said, no, we have to give them an update. At the end, no one wanted any more public consultation. So none of the city, none of the city members supported me in this, but we still had a dialogue at the end to explain to them the results of the trial, uh, make sure that people understood why the decisions were made. Mm -hmm. um, the experience from that was horrendous um, because we, came, we come from a culture where public consultation never happened before. Uh, people did not understand. The small businesses wanted business as usual, no change. People didn't want any change. So as I'm sitting here listening to you talk about the importance of consultation, and on the one hand, Maria was saying about you know, how it's important, but at the same time during your talk, you did mention about how you know, sometimes we just need to move quickly and, and it's, it's tough. So um, it's public consult, can, can you give a balanced, realistic uh, feel about public consultation? Uh, when you've talked to so many people, was, you know, how did it really influence the, the results? Did it really influence, um, what, could you get, you can't get consensus anyway. Um, so devils advocate, how useful is public consultation and to what balance, to what extent? Over to you, Maria. Okay. Now what I think is that, um, actually we, 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 cannot, we cannot decide anymore if we want it or not. Let's put it another way. I think that times have changed. I think that because of the social media and so many possibilities of information and interaction within, among people, uh, their expectation has changed. And the way of viewing things and viewing government has changed radically. You see, they don't believe in the wise Lord Mayor or his enlightened deputy uh, who know what is good for the city and who will just do it. They want to know exactly what is going to happen, and they want to express themselves, and they want to decide. Now, this third thing is the most difficult one. And this is why I mean that we need to have an honest discussion among politicians all over the world, which issues are actually suit suitable for, for consultation, where is it that it is meaningful to have people co-deciding, and which issues are there where you must consult them, you must explain things to them, you must provide information, but you have to decide yourself. And I think that this is one of the toughest and hottest issues in politics right now. Because you won't find many politicians who have the courage to stand up in front of their people and tell them, if we ask you all the time, if I had to visit 33,000 households, each and every time that I decide to change something, then we're not getting anywhere. And this is what I meant. So it's actually all about talking openly about when do we let people decide and when do we take decisions ourselves. And I believe that many issues that have to do with traffic, that have to do with mobility, are not suitable for public consultation. And I will end up by giving you just one example. The main problem when you ask people is who is going to be profiting out of change and who is going to be losing out of change. So if you have a project where you know that the same group of people who is going to be profiting is going to be losing something as well, it's easy to ask them, do you want the benefits or not? But if you have different groups of people that will be profiting and another group that will be losing, who are you going to ask? So there are so many problems that we have to discuss openly about and I would love it if we had something like a common strategy of cities in the end saying to people, yes, this is the way we have to do things, 
because right now I have a feeling that I'm almost one of the 10 people I know all over Europe who will address this problem openly. The other thing I would say is if your, if your leadership is marked by openness and transparency, then whichever person it is who comes after you, if they try to go back to a thing where nothing was discussed and nothing was transparent, they'll find it even more difficult than you found that very difficult first process of being open and transparent, and not being uh, trite when I say that, and I appreciate it's a very difficult situation you find yourself in, but best of luck with it. We're gonna wrap down the panel now. Before we leave, I wanna hear one thing that you've seen in the last couple of days. Can be in a keynote talk, it might have been talking to someone over lunch where you've gone, wow, that's pretty cool. I'm gonna do that in Vienna or Stockholm or the like. Uh, well, we'll start with you, Maria, let's swing down this way. What, what, what have you seen in the last couple of days that's made you go, wow? Well, there is something that I've seen here as well, and I want to have it in Vienna, and that's, this is colored bike lanes. Um, <laughs> I'm taking it back home, and I'll keep fighting so that I have my green lanes there as well. Superb. Morton, what have you seen? I'll say the whole discussion, uh, besides the enthusiasm, this is great, then uh, I'll say that the whole discussion about placemaking, that remembering this is not just about mobility, but actually about creating uh, cities, places, squares, whatever, that people want to be in, want to, to live in, and having that process moved on, uh, that's something I can do in Copenhagen. Huh? It's, it's very hard because there's so much, and, and, uh, and uh, this is my second uh, Velocity conference, and it was the same thing last year. You come home with a lot of uh, uh, data and support and uh, good examples on, on how change is being done, and, and you, can, you can put that on the table, uh, and, and, uh, and uh, you, you have a more easy way to, to make the change you need to do in, in your own city. But if I, uh, one thing that I saw today was uh, something that I, I really think was uh, uh, in, 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 innovative, that was uh, when we visited uh, uh, the school here in Adelaide, and uh, you had this uh, artwork on, on, the, on the concrete, on, on the asphalt, uh, uh, great colors and, and, and uh, like naive, uh, but, but very nice uh, art uh, painted, just to show that this is a school, slow down, uh, uh, think about the kids. That was magnificent. Now, Stephen, this goes through till Friday. What first thing Monday morning, what are you going to come in and change about Adelaide, something you've already seen so far? Okay, well, I can see four mayors from metropolitan Adelaide in this room, and I've seen people from South Australia uh, over the last couple of days. And what I want out of this um, is a cultural change in all of the local governments in South Australia that can work collaborative, collaboratively together uh, to communicate uh, a vision for the city that is more livable, more sustainable and much more economically product productive. So uh, what I'm going to implement over the next weeks, months and years uh, is a uh, mobilised vision for the city, uh, working with all the great people in South Australia to make this a city that embraces uh, integrated transport. Great stuff. Please give our mayors a big round of applause. Well, they great, Stephen, Per, Morton and Maria.